Welcome to this week's Fireside Chat with Jesse. I am joined today by Steve O'Leary, CEO and co-founder of Claris Capital. Thanks for joining me, Steve. You're welcome. Great to be here. No, um, absolutely, man. It's, it's a pleasure to spend some time with you um, this afternoon, uh, meeting you and your team a few weeks back when you guys kind of gave me an overview of, of Claris and what you guys are doing for the industry. And I'm excited to share your story here with my audience. So thanks again, Steve. We, we appreciate the, uh, the time as well. Yeah. So for those people who might not be familiar with yourself, do you mind just kind of giving your background in equipment finance? Well, it started started a while back. I, I, I started my career at Charmant Bank, and you're probably too too young to even know of Charmant Bank in Boston, but um, it, it, we I was part of the asset-based lending group, and during the recession, the 1990 recession, um, the regulators came in and closed down our equipment finance group, and they needed someone to go in, work it out. And that's what I did. That's how I got into the industry. And I met a lot of really good people that I didn't know much about it. So I was reaching out to people, members of the ELFA um, that I knew that were in Boston that could help me out as far as the learning process. But what, what transpired was as the recession went on and people were losing money in different portfolios, our portfolio held up really nicely. Um, and despite what the regulators thought, the, you know, we made money on the back end of deals, the credits held up. So what we did, we decided to, after that's the dust settled, was to get back into the industry. And we did in a fairly big way. So I, I ran that company for a couple of years before, and then we were sold to Fleet. And I spent some time at, at Fleet and also at at t Capital. Now at at t Capital, I spent time uh, in the capital market syndicating leverage loans, so leverage buyouts. And so that's sort of where I began to understand both markets a little bit. And you know, I did spend some time at, at Eastern Bank. I, I founded a, an equipment finance company for them. But then the opportunity arose to join New Star Financial, which their primary business was you know, leverage buyout, financing, senior debt. So, you know, my what I wanted to do and what they wanted me to do was to start a company and focus on that sponsor-owned, equity-owned companies uh, where you're, you're underwriting uh, leveraged credits for equipment financing. And so I was able to take both experiences and meld them together. And along the lines, I met some really great people. We did sell to a bank. Uh, in 2016, late 2016, early 2017, because New Star was also selling themselves. So, uh, so we sold uh, to Radius Bank. Spent three years there in a regulated environment. Really uh, wanted to get back to to be an independent. I enjoyed that time, and you know, in fact, focusing on this market. And what what has uh, what happened was there was a lot of people that I had worked with at New Star that were still there, but they became available. So I was able to attract them to, to come join us. And it was really Tim Conway, who was the founder and CEO of uh, New Star Financial. He joined us as chairman, Clarus. And then Mike Eisenstein, another founder, is our CFO. He was the treasurer of, um, of New Star. So it's it's just been a, a really lucky that uh, the stars sort of aligned and we were able to put this team together and and I think uh, a lot of it's we are, we're like minded but we have diverse uh, experience and skill so I think it's um, it's really we, we have a broad base of uh, of, of experience uh, our underwriters and credit folks we call it our investment management team half of them are equipment finance people, and then the other half spent their careers um, doing cash flow lending. So bringing them both together, I think we, uh, you know, it's, it's given us an advantage in the marketplace. We really understand that private equity owned sponsor leverage credit uh, market really, really well. Well, that's a unique perspective. So you've been a captive, you've been a bank. <laughs> And an independent. That's 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 kind of rare. Typically, you get the bank and the independent, but you throw AT and T Capital in there too. I know, I know. But uh, it, you know, so it, it, it's broad experience. But I really, the time I spent six or seven years at Newstar, that was probably in my career 
other than starting this was my favorite time as far as meeting people and, and just the uh, the overall environment, the type of people that the New Star attracted is what I wanted to build, try to replicate here, the same quality of people. Got it, got it. Yeah, so if you don't mind, do you mind just introducing Claris Capital? Yeah, so Claris Capital, we uh, opened our doors July 21st, 2021. So it hasn't been a year yet. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, our market, as I said, is our focus is doing uh, equipment financing where we don't specialize in any one type of equipment. We're generalists when it comes to equipment, industry. So we let the, the credit in industry, you know, determine you know whether or not we're interested in a particular transaction, and and then once we you know get comfortable with the business model, the capital structure, we determine what the need is, and then decide how we're going to structure and price the transaction. So, again, uh, you know, it, we think it's a little bit underserved market. Um, you know, if and I think. We, what helps us in the market is that we speak the sponsor's language. We also know all the challenges that the CFOs of these companies have. So we're able to speak to them when they, if they throw up a, a you know, a hurdle, something we have to get over, it's not something we haven't seen before. So, um, you know, that's our niche, you know, we're trying, we're, you know, we have uh, really flexible capital behind us, bar cap is a private equity firm and the capital that we have is given us um, the opportunity to, to try to really scale this business quickly. So we can hold up to, uh, you know, as, as little as five middle million, but we can go as high as $30 million, which is, which is unique for a company that is, uh, it, you know, as new as we are. So um, number of employees that you have? Right today? now we're, we're at 14. And the unique part of, of that is of the 14, 13 have worked for me at some point in time. And uh, the in the one person that doesn't is in charge of our capital markets, Chris Swan. Now, he hadn't worked for me in the past, but he's a Bostonian and we've done a lot of business together. And so we, we know each other very well, so. Well, obviously that speaks to you as a leader, Steve, if people are willing to, you know, because let's face it, July 2021, we're just kind of coming out of this pandemic, you know, it's not easy. So that speaks to, you know, how you led them at Newstar and everything else if they're willing to jump ship and start up something new with you. Yeah, and it's also to the other the other founders too, uh, you know, just uh, exceptional people and people. I, I, I told, I used to, my daughter just got out of uh, college and I was telling her about, you know, starting the new business. And I said, I, I couldn't think of doing it without the people that I have around me. It's, um, I view it as a, an all-star team. I'm really excited about the team. And, and our, then, our, okay. our plans are to grow the, the, the team, but we're being very selective. You know, mostly on the origination side, we're looking to to hire more people on the origination side, but making sure that they're a right fit from, from a standpoint of culture, work ethic and being able to fit in as, as a member of the team. And so obviously Massachusetts is brick and mortar where you're at today. Do you have any other offices around yeah, the we, country? We, right now we have people, who, uh, Ohio, Florida huh. and Utah. And we're looking to fill out um, various other places ge geographically. Okay, so you pretty much have it all covered. Eventually, maybe California, but Utah. We're hoping, close, uh, we're hoping, <laughs> west, southwest, a little, and uh, you know, fill fill in throughout. But what we're looking for is we don't really limit people geographically when we when we, um, you know, hire someone. We're just looking for someone that uh, can hit the ground running. And yep. is you know we you know we may have our guy in Ohio doing the deal in Florida, a guy in Florida doing the deal in Ohio if they have the contacts. Uh, so that's that's where we work. So we do have a direct origination staff calling directly on CFOs okay. and sponsors, but, and we have a capital markets desk to buying from you know other institutions. So um, what are we at here? Ten months in business. Uh, mm -hmm. By the time this airs, we'll be at eleven months in business. Um, like deals, number of deals. Where do you see yourself, kind of twelve months from now? Yeah, 12, well, I'll tell you where we, we expect to be by year end, and that's roughly 300 million in assets that's under management. 
and that's a real uh, hurdle that we want to get over because right now, uh, you know, we want to we want to be an issue in the ABS market, and that market's sort of all over the place. When we started this, the market was red hot. Now it's moving a bunch of different directions, but we think that that's the threshold that we want to reach before we we tap the ABS market. So our goal by the end of the year is to be at roughly 300 million in assets. Okay. And from an employee perspective, you'll stay right around where you're at? Or, and you, think, I know you said you're looking to grow. Yeah, the goal will be at 20 people. So 20 it'll be people mostly the on the origination side and, okay. and then just start filling in some of the infrastructure. But the infrastructure is fairly, uh, fairly well built out. But, you know, we want to make sure that we have depth there as well. So um, starting a new business, pros, cons, any lessons learned in your first 10 months, Steve? Well, I tell you, it took me 18 months to put this together. And <laughs> it's and it's a lot of hard work. And I guess people say, well, if it wasn't difficult, everybody would do it. But again, <laughs> yeah. having, the, having the people, you know, uh, Mike Eisenstein, the CFO, and Tim Conway uh, there, you know, right along, you know, uh, from day one working together nights and weekends trying to make sure that we had a business plan that made sense and we, it, 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 one that was well thought out but it was funny weeks would go by and we were at a point where we had several um, partners uh, that were willing to to, to to step up and Friday would come along we still hadn't made a decision so that it was it was it was it was a tough process um, but we think we you know, by being really, really patient and thoughtful, we think we've come up with the best possible partner uh, to move forward. So it wasn't, we weren't looking to jump and get it started just to get it started. We wanted to make sure all the parts were, uh, you know, fit in nicely. And the most important part of it outside of the people is the capital and, and uh, the amount of capital, the flexibility it provides us, and we think uh, we made we made the right decision. And it's proven out as we as we've started this. We've uh, we've enjoyed our partnership. We actually have our third board meeting today. We'll all be coming together uh, late this afternoon and then uh, dinner this evening. So looking forward to that. That sounds fantastic. And yeah, I mean, I know it's. It's one of those eager things, 18 months, that's a lot of patience um, in structuring this and getting everything. Cause it's sure eventually you get the itch where it's like, okay, can we just go and do this? Yeah, no, it was difficult too. It was right during the, 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 the part of uh, COVID and we really had, a, you, you couldn't really meet in person. So there was a lot of calls like this. And, and you know, we, you know, we, people knew knew us and we've met them before they knew us by reputation but it's still difficult if you can't sit in a conference room you know and, and yeah, so bang out the uh, the details so it's um it it's an enjoy i tell you it was difficult but very enjoyable and i i learned a lot so i don't really think there's any cons to to, to starting this other than there's you know some sleepless nights saying is it ever going to happen? And then when it does, it's okay. Now it's happened. Now you got to, you have to produce. You, you said yep. you'd do this, you put it on paper. Now it's time to, the, the, to, to make sure that it actually is uh, something you can do. So. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and that's also, it's, you have those other what, 13 people that are following you. So they're picking up, they're leaving their job in COVID. <laughs> right, right. To, to follow you. So sleepless nights, I can imagine that too, where yeah. dotting those I's, crossing those T's, that's a that's a lot to weigh on your conscience at any time. Yeah, and we have, you know, it's funny, I, we have a lot of, uh, a few younger people joining us. So um, it, I think for them, uh, that makes me really feel really good that we've gotten these young folks, really smart folks to join us. And they, uh, I think they're going to learn a lot because, you know, when you're in the ground floor, we're exposing them to everything and everybody here has a voice too. So yeah. we try, we, when we have meetings, we talk credit, we talk, you know, any kind of decision, we make sure we involve just about everybody so that they, they've learned. Even like we have an intern that's, that's joined us um, and we make sure that you know, he gets involved, he's, even if he's just sitting in meetings and, and listening, because that's, you know, and then coming out, you, you know what you have when, by the quality of the questions they ask afterwards. And so I'm really, I'm really excited about the younger people that we're bringing in. And, uh, you know, we hope to, we hope to bring in more, uh, you know, 
guys in their 20s and 30s as, as opposed to old folks like me. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, now, how are you tapping into these resources? Or is it local? Is it just friends of friends? Or like how you find the younger generation to bring on board? It's, um, well, it's, it's mostly, uh, we did a really good job at Newstock recruiting people younger. There'd be a, a new analyst class every year you know so they go out to the schools and it would be the best of the best would come in you know i think we had some crazy you know minimum gpa that you needed to have so i never could have gotten a job out of, <laughs> of school at new stop but um so what we've been able to do is we keep tabs on a lot of those people and then and, and then we're talking to them and also our chief investment officer jeff green he used to run uh, all the analysts at, at Newstar. So he has a lot of connections to, to those folks and he was part of the recruiting process. So, and we're reaching out to a lot. We have a lot of really, as you know, in Boston, a lot of really good uh, institutions here. Absolutely. And, you know, we've been able to tap some of those. And Mike Eisenstein is actually an adjunct professor at uh, one of the universities local. So the intern was one of his top students and we brought him in and he's, he's doing really well, so. That's good. Have you done a guest lecture program yet through the foundation? No, not yet. We did one back in February for the first time here at ASU. Not bad. Not bad. Yep. I mean, the questions that you get from younger kids, just because they don't know, you don't go to school for equipment finance, no, um, no. but just the questions you have and just like the follow-ups that we got and people applying for internships, it's uh, definitely something to check out. Yeah. So we're going to constantly, and we, you know, we hope these interns, you know, enjoy their time here and see it as a place of stepping stone to their career. So trying to keep the, the industry going and keep the industry young. I know we have one of our uh, uh, managing directors, our directors in our investment management team. He just got, uh, what is it, uh, 40 under 40 or one, top 40 under 40? Uh, yep, Joey yep, Cameron, yep. So. Nice, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny is I, I actually got that last year um, and it's like, God, I'm old. So I got in here. I, I joined the association when I was 23, which is kind of rare in equipment finance. Typically, it's like you're a little bit, you know, more seasoned before you get in. But uh, I was one of the fortunate ones. But it's good to see like when the monitor does stuff like that because it mm -hmm. gives people the recognition and it gets them a sense of self belong and everything else. Right, and you know, I'm I'm hoping that uh, you know we can we can attract more people, more younger people to the to the organization and to the industry. Absolutely. So I I want to circle back to one other thing. So you started this 18 month timer pre-COVID, correct? And then um, yeah, it was just. Uh, yeah, it was. It, I was it just was, I just wanted to, I just wanted to walk through your mindset real quick because it's like. You had this, you're starting the business plan before the pandemic started. And then when this actually hit, did it deter you at all? Or no, no, or? We, we viewed it. We thought that there would be, there would be opportunity, you know, when, when there's, you know, any kind of disruptions in the market, that, that there's opportunities. And we thought that, you know, because our, our market is non-investment grade. We thought that we'd see that, that market grow, um, and it, and, and it has. So we think that there's a lot of opportunities there and the private equity firms have a lot of capital that they're putting out. So there's a lot of activity and we thought it was a good time actually to okay. just the business. Nope, absolutely. Um, so that was just one of the final thoughts I had there on the going through that process. Um, so now you're back in the office, I guess, what are your thoughts in regards to like the future of work, Steve? like in office environment like hybrid work from home well the, the beauty i think what we've all learned is that people are capable of, of getting the job done remotely so we give people some flexibility but we're in three to four days a week i'm in every day um you know we're you know we have an office in boston that we we so what do we have we have three people remote we have so we have 11 people in the office we can grow this particular footprint so about 22 to 25 people in boston so we have a nice spot that we can expand and um it's uh you know so we're, we're hoping we think it's it's easier to collaborate and get things done when you when you're face to face
but we know people not now that we know people can get the job done remotely we're giving people flexibility and uh, you know if it's a tough day to commute or they have something going on with their kids at night or you know what, whatever it may be um you know we're, we're flexible with them but I, so i think it's going to be hybrid we'd like to see people in the office at least three days a week so no i mean it makes sense and it's crucial for those younger people too to well, be able to come in know, and learn just, yeah i think that's that is very important i felt badly for you know people graduating my daughter like i said graduated in 2020 her first job she never met anybody other than uh through zoom calls and it you, you know as being a you know 22 23 year old a, a part of it is just getting out meeting people um it's being social and um, i just i really enjoyed my 20s it, working in boston it was you know like I, I started at Charmit more in the finance side. So we were all like most young. Uh, and you know, it was it was part of my social life, it wasn't all my social life. But you, and again, from a learning standpoint, you're gonna you're more likely to walk into someone's office to ask them a question as opposed to pick up the phone and ask them a question. So I think it's a it's a better environment for, for younger people to learn. No, I just think of like when I was out of school, like Boston, like my first job was in New York <laughs> and like being able to go into an office and be able to learn and adapt, see what works for even on, I was always on the sales side. So it's like, you get this, sit there and listen to what other salespeople are doing, mm -hmm. pick and choose what, ah, I like that. I don't know about that. You know, just, just cutting your teeth that way in person. is just for me crucial, which I'll be curious to see how your daughter is going to be in the next three to five years. Because is, is she is she in an office environment now? Um, no, she's actually well one day a week and and uh, but the rest is is remote. So okay. overall, she's happy with that format. She is. She is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's she like you. She's in sales, and you know you can get the job done remotely but it's good to get in meet people and you know have those uh, those connections to folks well, absolutely and then she doesn't have to worry about a commute that you probably you and i had to mess around with with boston and new york <laughs> i know i know um so you've been in the equipment finance industry for a while steve um you know just thoughts on you know the industry and the relationships that you have um within equipment finance and what it's meant for your career? Well, it, it's meant a lot because, as I said, I was on the more of the financial credit side, and this was my opportunity when they gave me the responsibility at Shawmut to try to figure out what was wrong with the the portfolio, and there wasn't anything <laughs> wrong with it. That, and, and I think that that experience in, in tapping into people, uh, they were very everybody was very helpful. We were starting. Well, what happened after we decided? The portfolio is doing well. We're going to get back into it. Wrote the white paper, but it's hard to write a white paper when you haven't been in the industry, and you're gonna now you're gonna you want to grow the portfolio, and you have you know some real senior people on the credit side that you have to convince this is this is uh, this is where we should be investing our capital. So I you know reached out to a lot of people that you know never never met me before but they were willing to you know share what they knew their experience um, and it was uh it, it, it's been um very very valuable you know the, the the connections that i've had in the the industry and just um i think people's willingness to to help someone and i a lot of times it may be because oh yeah they'll they'll be an eventual uh investor of ours they'll be buying deals from us or, or, or we'll be buying deals from them and so it, it, it makes sense so anytime anybody ever reaches out to me i see people that are doing certain things and new members to the rfa if i if i you know if i can help i do and i think those those types of relationships go a long way and also from a reputation standpoint once you develop a reputation um you know people want to do business with you um, you know, if you what we what we try to do is make sure that every experience with us, and it's not always the case, is, is a favorable one. We try to be you know, responsive and, and and honest in, in all our interactions. But you know, we've had we had a few missteps early on as far as yeah. thinking we were going to do a deal and then decided we didn't want to do. You know, we, we try try to eliminate eliminate that at, at all if at all possible but sometimes things come up at the end and it's it's difficult to uh, to do but uh it, it's been the lfa has been a 
really, really good organization for me in my career. And, um, you know, I, it, we've got the younger guys involved. We sent uh, one of our younger guys out to Chicago uh, for the funding conference. And, uh, you know, he really enjoyed it, enjoyed meeting people. He had, you know, just through the last few years, he's talked to a ton of people on, on, on the phone, but had never met him person so it was good for them and so we're trying to you know pick different people make sure that they get exposure at some of these conferences as well and not just always the senior people yeah that's a that's an interesting dynamic there because these these conferences and travel especially now are not cheap to go to hmm. um so that was always i mean i was always on the sales side i've been on the service provider for 17 years so i was always fortunate where i got to go to like the elfa convention and stuff like that but um, like tapping into like emergence, I don't know if you're sending anyone to to Colorado. Um, I think that's in June or July. No, probably, but, um, probably. But that's something for younger people that might be of value too, Steve. I'll, I'll look into it. Okay. Um, so I ask everyone who comes on here a little fun fact about themselves. Um, Pretty boring guy, I tell you. Uh, nah. What makes you what, what makes you tick outside of work? Well, what you know, it's it's family and um, very. Uh, we're all we're always into sports. So my kids played all sorts of sports. I I played baseball in college and I coach baseball. And right now the kids are all a little bit older. My uh, my daughter, who was a college hockey player, I spent the last you know four years or not going up to University of Vermont watching her play hockey. So that sort of, that was our social life. So my wife and I are trying to figure out what to do with ourselves now that the kids are all done playing <laughs> sports. So it's, uh, it, it, you know, it, that had been a big, big part of our life, both coaching and just being a, uh, a spectator there to support our kids. That's fantastic. Yeah, the empty, uh, the whole empty nest thing. I'm sure it's an interesting dynamic now. <laughs> it is, it's different. <laughs> different so we have to figure out what's next now uh celtics big celtics fan red you Sox, know i'm not a big Bruins. nba fan but i am a celtics fan this year uh, i guess i jumped on the bandwagon i i just like the the, the makeup of the team and uh, when they play together they're a really good team and i just like you know they're very hot nose tough tough unit so it'll be fun they're down 2-1 they play again tonight so we'll see how that goes um so yeah you know Bruins disappointed me this year but I, I'm, I'm also a Bruins and a Red Sox at, and and a Patriots fan and um, so yeah sports is always a big part of uh, like I said our lives and, and watching it together uh, even now that we're not all living under one roof the texts go back you know throughout the throughout the night when the game's on they have to catch me with these late starts. Uh, they, you know, they have to catch me in the morning because I usually don't make the end of the game. You know what? Another big advantage when I moved from New Jersey to Arizona in 2010 was Monday night football starts at like six o'clock. So you could actually watch the end of a game without. <laughs> well, everybody in Boston is complaining about the Celtics starting at 830 to accommodate the people on the West Coast. But. I don't know why they would need to accommodate. I mean, Miami is the other team, so it's not like it's like. Yeah, I guess they think it's more of a national thing when you're in the semifinals, so that everybody's sort of interested. But start at seven. That way, I can I can watch the entire game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, Steve, like, why do business with Claris Capital? Well, I think to some of the points I made, uh, you know, we 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 try not to be all things to all people. Um, we want to service the markets that we do, which is, you know, highly levered middle market companies. Uh, you know, we don't want to compete against banks. Uh, we're tr a true independent. And what we try to do is provide feedback and, and um, issue term sheets that we can stand behind. So we're using our balance sheet. We're not, we're not syndicating, although we may down the road syndicate, but it will only be in cases, typically in cases where we're holding a big slug of it you know we have exposure issues but you know to our you know getting back to the origin and the name uh claris capital stands for clear bright respected and that's that's how we want to be perceived and we're developing some really good relationships and getting some really good feedback um from you know from the people that we've closed deals with um 
you know, it, they could be new customers, customers that, that we've never done business with. And a lot of that has to do again with the people, you know, our investment management team, you know, when they're trying to develop the credit memo and underwriting the deal, they try not to waste people's time. They, 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 they get to the point, ask pointed questions and, um, Carol Larkin, who runs our, our documentation uh, group, and she also she 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 started back at Charmant with me, so we've uh, we've been together a long, long time, and you know she just has a great rapport with 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 clients. So we're trying to be someone that if we say we're going to do something, we're going to stand by it. Uh, as I said, we may we had a couple of mis missteps early, but right now everything is 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 going really smoothly. Um, and in the market, like I said earlier, the sponsor owned private equity market is something that we really know really well. We understand, you know, some of the issues that CFOs and sponsors may have. So we try to, uh, you know, make sure that, that that knowledge and that experience comes across and we're able to provide a solution to any kind of, uh, you know, problem or financing that they may have. Excellent. Well, I'm excited. I mean, congratulations on your first, um, you know, 11 months in business now. i um, excited to see, well, maybe we'll have to check in in another 12 months from now and see where, uh, and see where things stand. <laughs> Absolutely. We look forward. But I uh, appreciate your time today, Steve, and look forward to crossing paths at an upcoming ELFA event in the near future. Yes. yes. Well, thank you. Have a good day, sir. Thank you. You too.